All right. If a radius of 3 meters sweeps out 34 degrees, what is the magnitude of the arc length? Now, I know we went over this uh, equation. Theta is equal to S over R. But it's very important to realize that this theta right here, this has to be, must be in radians. Those of you who used um, 34 degrees here probably got a wrong answer, right? Probably got like over 100 or something like that. So here, my theta is equal to 34 degrees. Now, I have to convert this degrees into radians. So pi radians is equal to 180 degrees. So the degrees will cancel out nicely, right? Giving you radians of 0 0.5934. So now we can use this information. So 0 0.5934 is equal to S over R, which is 3 meters. Now again, radians is really no unit. So when I multiply 3 meters by 0.5934 radians, the radians just goes away, actually. Okay? So the arc length S is equal to 0 0.5934 times 3 meters, and that comes out to 1.78 meters. All right? I don't know how many of you actually uh, got... Um, 102, right? I know some of you probably got 102 as the answer, but that is not correct. All right. Let's take a look at number two. Convert 35 radians to degrees. So 35 radians, we want to convert that into degrees. So in pi radians, there are 180 degrees and again the radians would cancel out okay and if you use your calculator properly I think you'll get something like 2,005.35 degrees okay any questions so far okay Convert 62 degrees into radians. So here, I have 62 degrees. Now, in order to convert that into radians, there are pi radians per 180 degrees. So if you use the calculator correctly, you get 1.082 radians. Now, if you were to do this in a correct sig figs, okay, this should come out to 1.1 radians. If you were to do correct sig figs on this, right, this should be 2.0 times 10 to the third degrees, right? And for this one, the correct sig fig would be 2 meters. Right? This is the only chapter I'm going to, you know, go nuts with sig figs. After this chapter, just round your answer to uh, two decimal places and I'll be happy. All right, next. Here it looks like we have one sig figs, two sig figs, so every time when we do multiply and divide, we should round our answer to one sig fig, just so you know, okay? So here we have a right triangle with hypotenuse C, and that is 7 meters, and A happens to be 
3.5 meters and they want to know what the B is, right? And since we know C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared, right? So B squared is equal to C squared minus A squared. So B squared is equal to 7 squared minus 3.5 squared. All right, so if you do your math correctly, your B is equal to 6.06 .06 meters. And if you want to do this correct sig fix, it should be 6 meters. What is theta, right? Um, well, we can do this theta many different ways because we know all three components. We can do sine, cosine, or tan, right? Um, if we were to use what's given to us in a problem, which is the opposite and hypotenuse, because what if we did this one wrong? Then we're going to double jeopardize ourselves. So if we were to use the ones that are given to us, maybe we should use sine, right? So sine inverse of, right? Opposite over hypotenuse. Therefore, theta is equal to sine inverse of opposite, which is 3.5 meters and 7 meters. And notice how the meters cancel out nicely. Your theta should come out to something like 30 degrees. Okay? And of course, if you were to do a correct sig fix, your theta should come out to something like 3 times 10 to the first degree, but that's kind of ridiculous. So you could just leave it as 30 degrees, and I know that this is one sig fig, okay? All right, some of you who may have left your calculator in radiant mode, and if you did that, you might have gotten an answer of 0 0.5 two, three, five, nine, eight, seven, eight radians, okay? I mean, this is not wrong as long as you put that um, radian unit down, okay? But if you say this is degree, that means this obviously is wrong, right? So make sure you put your units down because the units will make a difference, okay? So you can say also like 0 0.5 radians. All right. Any questions so far? All right, good. So um, let's move on. Let's take a look at some functions. Okay. Let's take a look at some functions. Um, if we were to take a look at many different functions that were given to us, um, we already know most of these. Okay, so I'm just going to review them very quickly. So y as a function of x. So in this case, y value depends on whatever your x value that you plug into the function, okay? So this is read y as a function of x. This is the independent variable and this is a dependent variable okay it's always recognized that you put dependent on the vertical axis and independent in the horizontal axis in physics independent variable can be time right most of the times, it's time, okay? Most of the times. Dependent variable can be position, velocity, okay? Acceleration, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, okay? Because time is what variable we can use to plug in to find out what the, where the position is, how fast it's going, what kind of acceleration it, you know, it possesses, etc. Now, here, an example. 
this looks like a linear equation where the function of y of x is equal to 3x plus 10. So we all know, if we were to graph this, here's your x, here's your y, right? And your y-intercept is 10, right? And then it has a slope of 3, and then it goes like one of these johns, right? So as the variable x is changed, a new y value is obtained. We know that. The x is therefore independent variable, right? Independent variables are plotted on the horizontal axis, and this is the control variable. The dependent variable, of course, is the y-axis, okay? And it is plotted vertically, right? And this is the outcome of the experiment, all right? So, here's the important thing. As you are asked to plot speed as a function of time, okay, that speed versus time, you would plot the speed in the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So, it's always red y-axis versus x-axis, okay? Okay, or position versus time, or velocity, right, versus time, acceleration versus time. So, in, in all these cases, you're going to have, okay, position versus time, okay, velocity versus time, acceleration versus Okay, so please make sure you understand which axis is what. It's always y versus x. Now here's the here's a important thing. Okay, on uh, Microsoft Excel, right, right, um, uh. your dependent and independent right variables you put your independent variable in the first column and your dependent variable on the second column so this is kind of messed up so even though you read dependent versus independent graph, you actually put the independent in the first column, right, and then dependent on the second column. So for example, like this would be like time, right, and then this will be like position, okay? So, so it's kind of backwards for Microsoft, so be careful with that. And we will go over how to use Excel for um, graphing and so on. Okay, all right, moving right along, okay, there are different types of functions, okay. Um, the zeroth order function is known as a constant function, which means when things are constant, um, we're going to have, okay, just horizontal line that is going to be constant, okay. So, for example, y equals 1. No matter what time it is, it's always going to be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, right? So it's constant. And that would be known as the zeroth order. Then, you also have, let's say, um, first order. 
first order is a linear function where it has the form of y equals mx plus b. Okay? So y equals mx plus b will give a straight line that is horizontal, not horizontal, diagonal, I'm sorry, diagonal, diagonal. Okay? And this would be the first order, okay? For in this case, your b is zero because that's the y-intercept is zero, right? And then we have quadratic. Now we know that quadratic, quadratic is a second order, and quadratic usually has, you know, parabola, one of these joints, okay? And then we have uh, cubic, and cubic, which is third order, and this graph will have something like like one of these Johns, okay? Or it could be it could be one of these, you know, like one of these, okay? So it could be either this or this, and that will be cubic. Okay, so I like to think of it this way, like every time there's an order, like first order, it has no hump, second order, one hump, right, third order, two humps, and, and I think that helps recognize things very quickly, okay, so for example, if we were to look at the third order, which is this, and that is this right here, right, this looks like a it almost has two humps, right? And then, and then, the second order right here, the purple one, this is the purple one right here, which is parabola, right? It sounds like a disease, like Ebola, parabola, right? So I don't know. I thought it was pretty cool. All right? So, so this is what we have. And then, of course, this is linear, so just straight line for the uh, for this one. It's just straight line that goes like so. so right? That's linear. So make sure you can recognize those. And there's some other functions that you should be also familiar with. Okay. Maybe I should give you... Inverse functions, for example, that's when you have your variable in the denominator, okay? When you have a variable in the denominator, you will have one of these, right? Now, what happens when it approaches zero? This cannot be zero. So if you think of the smallest number you can ever think of, that's not a zero. Right, like zero point zero 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 zero, like million zeros, and then like one. And if you divide any constant by that small number, this thing's gonna blow up to infinity, right? It's just gonna shoot up to infinity, but you'll never reach zero. You you would never get there. Okay, so think that think about that, and that's what happens. So whenever you have a variable in the denominator, you will get an asymptote, vertical and asymptote, okay? In this case, it's going to be, the vertical asymptote is going to be at zero, all right? So here is the inverse function in the first order, and here's the inverse function that is square or second order. So inverse squared, when you have some constant divided by x squared, no, notice how sharper it turns up, right, towards, towards the uh, asymptote. And this is like the inverse square root, okay, or 
y is equal to k over one of those johns, right? So this is like a half power, right? And notice this is actually much shallower, right? Much shallower. Okay. And if you go to the other side, obviously it's going to shoot down this way, right? And well, you can't really take a negative square root, so it's only going to stay on this side. All right. What's up? What's up, Charlie? You all right? Got a slide whistle going there, Charlie? <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for the entertainment. Uh, power function. Power function is when you have a variable as an exponent. Okay. Um, for example, e to the x. Right. And this thing will rise up very quickly if you were to think about the power of being up here. All right. So it's going to just like shoot up much quicker than just like x squared function. So x squared looks like almost like a linear line here when it's actually a parabola compared to the power function. So to exaggerate this, if you were to look at a power function, power function will shoot up like this where where like you know other ones gonna go like that so this is gonna be like x squared and this is gonna be like e to the x okay so it's, so it's act, this is not a straight line okay it looks like straight line compared to this but it's not all right good good Now let's do some uh, measurements and uncertainties, okay? Um, we need to understand uh, the difference between precision and accuracy before we start measuring things, okay? Uh, a lot of times uh, we are familiar with accuracies, but we're not quite familiar with precision. And precision is the part that's going to have to be um, I don't know, um, talked about more, okay? So to give that idea, let's go to the next page first, okay? If we were to go uh, on a target range and we shoot some arrows, right? And then if you're really not um, good at this and you're, you're there for the first time, and then you shoot an arrow and you're like, you know, hitting... You're, you know, all over the place, right? Like, this is neither precise nor accurate. There's no precision there whatsoever, and nothing is really on the thing, right? So you practice more, right? You practice more, and then you start to get this thing nice grouping going so this you got a pretty decent precision right here right but you're off the target so you're precise but you're not really that accurate okay here you know you're you're now you're trying to aim towards the target and you're somewhat accurate, it looks like, right? You're, you're like hovering around the bullseye, I guess, and you are hitting the target sheet, right? So, so you're, you're like accurate, but you're not quite precise, okay? But, but you practice more and you get your precision and accuracy now you can go to the Olympics. All right? So, in scientific terms, okay, when we do measuring, okay, if we were to use a very precise instrument, 
it has finer increments, right? This is precise up to one thousandth of a meter, okay? So this is a lot more precise than, than this, okay? Where this one only has, um, what is that, sixteenth, uh, right? And then this is 32nd, right, of an inch, where this is thousandth of a meter versus 132nd inches, right? So this is slightly more precise than this, okay? As far as measuring accurately, you have to measure it as accurately as, as possible. So this looks like, okay, almost 15, right? Almost 15 uh, centimeters. So if you want to really make it precise, right, you can actually, uh, I can't zoom in right now, but you can actually go zoom this in and then say, hmm, this is like 14.9, I don't know, it's almost 15, so it's like 14.97 or something. So that 7, so 14.97, even though this value is an estimated value, it is still significant, okay? So, so even though, right, seven is estimate, uncertain value, it is still significant. Okay? It is still significant. It's very important to understand that. So when you record something like that, this has precision of one hundredth of a decimal place, right? But if you were to use something much bigger, right, then your precision is not quite there, okay? So here you got like, yeah, five and like, I don't know, you're looking at something much more archaic, okay? So it's like half, quarter... Eighth. Oh, this is, it only goes up to 16th, okay? It only goes up to 16th, not 32nd. So it's like, you know, this is like three quarters, right? And then, I don't know, this looks like uh, seven eighth, and then a little more, right? So this is really kind of hard to do with using fractions, so I don't know how you would actually guesstimate this right here, right? So you could break it up into 16th, I guess, right? So 14.5 over 16 or something. I don't know. That's kind of weird, right? 5 and 14.5 over 16th of an inch. That's America for you. All right? So, so... I'd rather have this, which is nice and clean, than that. All right. So if we were to work with this uncertain value, this uncertainty carries over when you start calculating with the value. Okay. So, so let's take an example right here now. Let's say we measure a width of a board, just like the way we measured the length of this line, right? So here we, we measure the length to be like 14.97, right? But give or take, you know, 0 0.01, right? So it could be like 
0.98 or it could be 0.96 okay so in this case the width of the board happens to be 23.2 plus or minus 0.1 centimeters okay so this is not as precise as this ruler right here obviously all right so the measurement was precise within tenth of a centimeter okay so plus or minus 0.1 centimeters called the approximate or estimated uncertainty of the measurement so when a measurement is given without an approximate uncertainty then we just assume plus or minus of the last specified digit okay so for example for example if I were given let's say 42.1 okay and there's no there's no uncertainty value given then this can be translated into it could be 42.1 plus or minus 0 0.1 centimeters so this can be 42.2 or it can be 42.0 as your measurement okay all right so accuracy tells how well a measurement is compared to a standard or theoretical accepted value okay so to find an accurate right how accurate we are right to find out how accurate we are calculate the percent error using this formula now this here is the absolute value right so this top numerator will always be positive theoretical value is what is accepted value in the scientific community all right times 100 percent okay so here's an example for that the current best value for the speed of light happens to be this this is the theoretical value So what is the percent error if your measurement of speed of light happens to be, wow, bigger than the theoretical value? Maybe you should win a Nobel Prize for that. All right. So to figure out the percent error, okay, we follow this formula. The measure value, so this is the measure value. So 3.001 times 10 to the eighth meters per second minus the theoretical value 2.889 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. I don't know about this. This, this does not look kosher to me actually. Somebody Google that and fact check me on this value. This is kind of, this is not, does not look closer. Extra points? All right, well, let's see. Everybody's asleep? Hmm. Let's see, speed. Yeah, that's what I thought. The theoretical value should be 2.998 times 10 to the 8th. I knew it. This is not right. Meters per second. So it should be 
998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Whole thing divide by 2.998. Times 10 to the eighth meters per second times 100 percent is equal to. So if we get our calculators out, I get 0 0.10007 percent. So that's almost like 0.1 percent error. So that's pretty darn good actually. Uh, in high school you're expected to uh, stay below 10% error in your experiments. Uh, undergraduates in college, they want to keep you under 5%. When you're doing graduate level, they want to keep you under 1% error. And if you're doing your PhD and so on, they, they want you less than 1% error, definitely. They want it in decimals. So, so for, for you know high school, if you could get this, you should be getting your PhD. All right, that pretty much concludes your chapter one notes. All right, and I will stop the recording and restart. All right, so let's see.